<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 12:30 breakout session of the Open Simulator Community Conference 2013. As a reminder to our in-world and web audiences, you can view the full conference schedule on our website, conference.opensimulator.org, and you can post your questions in local chat, on Ustream chat, or tweet your comments using the hashtag OSCC13. This hour, we are happy to introduce you Tony Alatalo, who will be presenting Real Extend and Open Simulator Development. Is there a connection? Tony Alatalo is a Real Extend developer and game programmer at PlaySign. He has been involved with Real Extend since almost the beginning, from late 2007, and was responsible first for the scripting API in the next generation uh, Nali Tundra effort and later at one point for the whole open source project. He now acts as a development coordinator within the Real Extend Association. Welcome Tony Alatalo. Uh, thank you and um, no, thank you everyone for for coming and um, it's been really a pleasure to uh, um, yeah, to get to experience all this, I haven't had much time to uh, to be in uh, in world recently. Not not nearly as much as I hope for. Um, and even here, I'm using just um, the default avatar that uh, that just somehow happened to uh, to come to this this presence. Um, I have three children and running a small company and we are just uh, finishing our game and and then there's uh, all these real extent things going on as well so uh, living a, a bit busy life but it has been really nice to be here now and and focus focus on this um, it was also really a quite inspiring keynote I found by uh, Grady Bush but I figure here we sort of come down to more uh, mundane uh, mundane matters of uh, uh, open source project and and uh, software development but okay so um, so this talk about it is about real extend and an open simulator and basically the question is whether whether this talk is on topic at all that does this something to does does this have anything to do with open simulator but but um, but to get there, a little bit of history, uh, old news for I know um, many of them, but um, perhaps perhaps an interesting um, sort of recap. Anyway, so so what is um, real extent? There's actually quite often misunderstandings about it. Sometimes um, people think it's a particular piece of technology. Um, Sometimes people think that it's um, it's a company, but actually it's an um, it's an organization, um, an open open source organization, and a really loose one. It's basically like a mailing list, so uh, so similar to uh, to Open Simulator. And um, and the idea of of the organization is simply to uh, do uh, uh, open source virtual worlds platform development and uh, and to allow anyone to uh, to set up their own own virtual worlds and and develop whatever applications on top of that so in that sense it's it's basically the same that the um, that the over over the uh, foundation and and the open sim community is is doing and that's of course also why why it's really interesting to be here and seeing seeing this in action so this history we have a lot of history with Open Simulator. Um, the first real extent prototype was um, published in 2007, and it was a modified version of both um, the Linden Labs viewer and the uh, and the Open Simulator server. And um, I wasn't much involved in the first phase, um, but the other guys hacked in quickly a lot of stuff in a few months. Um, 
notably um, mesh uh, support support in 2007 and and the whole uh, Augur uh, graphics system to the Linden VR uh, that gave us um, uh, we could put our shaders there or whatever and um, and then there was also this uh, sort of global avatar system which was uh, well not the same as hypercrit but but similar idea that you can have your single identity and and use that to visit uh, any any world um, and there was quite a bit of uh, enthusiasm then in the in the open sim community that there was all this development um, well we'll talk more later about what happened then but sort of fast forward to uh, today um, we still exist. The, nowadays, is this uh, Real Extend Foundation, um, and we have the Real Extend Association. The divide there is that the foundation is sort of a secure thing that exists to um, protect the name and and sort of protect the brand. But the foundation doesn't really do anything. Um, Juha Hulko, this uh, whose avatar is shown in the picture, and and who is the uh, originator of the whole thing, is the chairman of the foundation. And then the city of Oulu, here in northern Finland, uh, is also uh, supporting the foundation a little bit. Um, and then there's the association, which is uh, open for anybody to join in, uh, and which is in practice is largely the mailing list discussions and IRC talks. And there we have most acti actively the um, the few uh, like four or five uh, companies that have been developing real extent past the year, past, during the past years and and some um, yeah some other people and companies. Um, what else? And the basic idea in this is that um, we are quite business oriented still. I would say this Juha Hulko, the founder, is a businessman. Um, who started a company in the 80s, uh, Electrobit, and um, they do sort of embedded software and electronics, and 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 uh, he became uh, financially independent uh, through the 90s as the company succeeded. So in 2005 or so, this business person was just having free time and looking around that what's interesting, and he f uh, encountered Second Life. And really like the idea of of uh, virtual worlds. Um, he saw so many applications, um, exactly uh, this kind of conferences and meetings to uh, to cut down travel needs, but then also uh, simulations and planning and er everything. And actually, the um, the motto for real extent by by this person is to uh, to save the planet. He really wishes that um, that we can use virtual worlds to. Uh, to save the humanity. So we also have a connection to the keynote here. But anyhow, the, the idea is that the whole the basic platform is, is open source and um, and free to use. Anybody can set up their own server, like with Apache for websites or, or OpenSIM for, for this kind of words. But, uh, but the vision is that there would be business in the applications that companies can host and host and develop for for uh, for other companies and so forth, and um, and yes, um, I actually don't have a like an awful lot of material, but I'm hoping for discussion here. So please just um, intervene at any point if uh, if something is unclear or if you want to ask ask anything. But um, continue from here. Anyway, so okay about the specific history that we have with OpenSIM. Um, Hopefully we can learn something from there. So, so we had this uh, initial release uh, with the prototype, and um, and there was many OpenSIM developers were develop enthusiastic, and there was quite a lot of OpenSIM developers at that time, and many companies just kind of a, the boom, and there was a plan to um, to merge, for example, the mesh support to the core and so forth. Uh, make long story short, that didn't really go that way. Um, I actually don't know even all the reasons, but 
eventually we got a quite nice solution that the real extent extensions were implemented in this um, modrex uh, an open sim uh, module which you could install and then you would be able to use the uh, the enhanced viewer to um, to get all the custom scripting stuff and the uh, and the meshes at the time and so forth so at this point um, um, it became so that the um, when when the companies here were trying to do do business with this incarnation of, of real extent uh, the problem point really became the uh, the second life viewer base uh, as it was discussed here in the uh, in the viewer panel um, uh, some hours ago uh, it's quite spaghetti code it's difficult to uh, to modify it's um, it's not modular and when and when some company um, wants to make a service or an application for for some company they really have to um, to be able to make it the way the customer wants and needs it they it really needs to have exactly the kind of user interface and the user experience that is needed there and, and it's not a good excuse there to to tell that we can't really change that it's it's hard coded in the uh, in the platform so after some studies and and i think quite a lot of discussion and so forth we eventually decided that okay uh, we need to write a new um, viewer application from scratch and um, and that work begin began in uh, in the beginning of 2000, 2009 and uh, i was quite much involved then and and the new code base there's two sort of key things one is that it's modular that um, it, it has this plugin plugin architecture for like physics and and rendering and and um, most of the things are implemented in plugins some of them you can actually enable and disable and and some not really but um, but for example scripting uh, is a plugin and so forth and and the other thing is that that for the scene data uh, so what in in second life and open sim uh, you would call uh, prim uh, parameters or something like that that what um, what uh, what kind of objects you can have in the scene and what um, um, what parameters do those objects have uh, we made that um, using a popular this uh, entity component uh, idea uh, we just took that from the game engine literature where uh, during the past five years then also it had become popular as a way to do um, sort of nicely modular and extensible uh, um, yeah, uh, environments um, the, the idea is that instead of um, subclassing you uh, you have these scene entities which are not typed so anything in the scene is just an entity and then you have these components which implement some uh, functionality for the em for the entity so for example any entity that has a position uh, has a placeable component where you have the 3d position so that makes it simple in the way that that for example if you have uh, like in second life you have avatars and prims um, those are two different kinds of objects and and if you then uh, for example make a game there's often quite deep uh, type hierarchy that you have uh, physical objects and non-physical objects and and you get this tree of classes and subclasses uh, with the entity components it does not work like that uh, so for example for normal objects and avatars they both have the placeable component exactly the same way so um, so when you for example want to move an object it doesn't matter whether it's an avatar or or some other object because the placeable component is the same for all objects so it's um, in this way it simplifies um, programming and the other idea is that that you can add your own components so uh, whatever you come up with you you can implement it in a component and then just start adding those components to your to your objects and this is the same design that for example uh, unity uses 
so quite many uh, Unity 3D um, plugins or modules, they, uh, they add these components that you can use. But okay, so, so we were working for, on that for the viewer side. And, um, but then there was the question of the server. And we wanted to continue using uh, OpenSIM. But the OpenSIM scene was not made like, um, like that. It wasn't really extensible. Um, the prims, ha prims have a certain set of parameters, and that's that. And so, so there was this, uh, we called for people, uh, and we had some money for this work. So we called um, for proposals from OpenSIM developers to um, refactor the, the OpenSIM uh, core scene to be extensible. And um, eventually Adam Frisbee's um, proposal got selected and he started working on it and the, um, and the core developers agreed well, that it, this is a good idea. Um, but unfortunately uh, it happened during that year that, that Adam um, drifted to other things, I think some commercial uh, MMOs and so forth. So he wasn't involved with OpenSIM anymore and, and actually uh, didn't finish this work. He was really sorry and and didn't want the money, of course. But but it was also bad for us because we didn't get the uh, the kind of server that we would have wanted. Um, so sort of the last step here is that that sort of as an emergency measure, uh, we because we were also really not capable of doing this open sim refactoring ourselves, and uh, and this funding was ending by the end of 2010 uh, as a sort of emergency backup plan we started using the new uh, viewer code base as the server as well because there we already had the uh, the extensible uh, scene structure and and the modular architecture and everything so 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 that's what we have nowadays this we call it tundra the um, this kind of SDK which is used both as the uh, as the server and, and the client. Um, this is from uh, Adam's um, proposal uh, for for the uh, for the OpenSIM um, scene, which he posted to the uh, to the OpenSIM developers mailing list in December 2009. And I was googling for this and actually also found it that it was in um, in Justin's uh, predictions for OpenSIM for yet. 2010 that that this would happen so uh, if you if you can see in the slide here um, the uh, left uh, top left part here is the um, what I believe is still the current uh, open seam skin scene structure and uh, that the, that we have um, scene object groups and those consist of scene object parts Basically, the prims, I think, and those have the fixed set of parameters, and that's that. Um, the idea was to first make this hierarchical, so that there wouldn't be the separation of groups and parts, but uh, it would be like a normal hierarchy where um, all the nodes in the hierarchy are the same. And then in the in the last step, which is at the bottom, um, uh, it would have been refactored to this. Um, to this new um, structure where add-ons can add sort of new uh, well let's say components to the uh, to the scene objects so if, for example meshes could have been added as an add-on and anyone anybody could add anything um, anything they want um, to the scene data uh, from an add-on and the thing is that um, that then and like we have in Tundra now, is that when you implement these own components, uh, everything works for those automatically. So you just define the data that you want to have in your application, and it all gets synchronized uh, over the network to all the participants automatically. Uh, you don't have to implement your own network messages or anything like that. And also when you save and load the scenes, um, the also your data gets saved so that's sort of the idea that to make it easy to make applications um, and yeah Telavos is correct there's nowadays this uh, the uh, 
uh, there is an extensibility mechanism to to OpenSIM now, um, but the idea here would have been to sort of refactor the core so that also the core features would have been uh, sort of add-ons. But okay, that was that was that part of the story. Um, so now we kind of come come to where we are now. Um, so looking from sort of our perspective, from the real extent micro universe, uh, it seems that OpenSIM and, uh, and Second Life have developed nicely, actually. There's also this meshes here nowadays, um, materials. Um, we have had wonderful uh, stability, for example, in this conference. Um, it's, it's mature in the sense that people know these tools very well and the, and the tooling uh, with all the exports and imports nowadays, uh, ORs and ERs are nice. Um, the Second Life renderer is actually quite amazing. It um, does a good job um, uh, rendering um, user-generated content, which is not easy at all. And um, yeah, it's cool. Um, still, f looking from our point of view, um, it's still the same, and the, and the reasons why we had to stop using it are still there. Um, LLUDP protocol is the same as it was, and it, in effect, uh, kind of hard codes this uh, world model, and uh, and the scene is also kind of hard coded. And what what do you have? Um, this was also discussed in the um, in the viewer panel, the uh, the client side scripting and custom user interfaces and controls are not really there uh, yet, um, except for this um, was it Octopus from one of the your projects uh, sounded interesting. Um, so on the real extent side, uh, our our little uh, Tundra SDK is um, is stable. It's not alpha or beta. Uh, um, it's it's used in uh, in business, um, and there we have all the. It's easy to do custom applications. You can you can do all any kind of uh, user interface you want. And and when when a user comes to your server using the client, uh, they then download the user interface assets and uh, and and you can have. Um, most of the applications are developed in, in JavaScript, so it, um, so this client-side JavaScript um, is then executed in the client, and you can do whatever custom um, functionality you want. Uh, for example, avatars are not a part of the core, but it's actually a script that you can put on your server if you want to have avatars on your server, and so forth. Um, so, so it's kind of good. Um, we also have worked, um, at least done all kinds of little experiments with uh, WebGL and WebSockets client through the years. Um, and now it is sort of maturing. There's an alpha um, client that um, you, can, uh, you can test on the, uh, on the MeshMoon hosting service. Mm. And um, and yeah, uh, this the whole meshmon thing is quite a um, uh, key part of the real extent economy. Uh, so meshmon is um, is by one one of the companies, uh, Adminotech, who decided to uh, to focus on hosting. Um, mm, and um, and they have this. It's similar to Kitely, I think, the, in the sense that it's um, dynamic. So currently they have um, um, about 850 scenes or worlds uh, in their service, and and it's free to create a test account there if you want to test creating your own space. And and it works so that when somebody logs in, it then starts up a um, a cloud um, instance. And um, so yeah, that's why it can be quite uh, cheap. So um, 
so this is how I see the uh, the OpenSIM community and, and the real extend uh, sort of much smaller but still uh, surviving community. And um, and my question here is basically whether whether um, whether we are relevant to each other. Um, I'm certain that it's a good idea to, uh, for, at least for me, to come here to see uh, all the uh, exciting um, applications that people are doing and to sort of learn that um, what sort of usages um, for uh, virtual worlds are interesting and what, what works and uh, what is perhaps not so interesting. Um, but I'm also curious whether whether there would be actually something that that we could do together whether it would make sense to um, to perhaps uh, share some technologies or or whether um, yeah whether the real extender technologies could be somehow relevant to the uh, to the open sim community um, we did make them because we wanted to address um, basically this uh, customization problem that that we uh, we encountered with OpenSIM, um, or did we just uh, diverge into sort of separate parts and and uh, and there really is no uh, much much of a connection anymore. So so that's um, that's why I came here. Um, yeah, to answer Robert's question, the. Um, mm, it's a, it's a bit of it's in a bit of a progress thing the um, there's a there is a completely open source uh, web tundra implementation but that's using a really naive simple uh, um, like just an uncompressed uh, JSON uh, messaging because there's also one other implementation by by Adminotech which is an optimized um, binary protocol but that one is not open source yet. They are in the progress of uh, of open sourcing it. But um, but actually, the protocol and the messages used um, over WebSockets uh, is the same that we use in the native Tundra, which is uh, open source. And actually, now it's also even documented just uh, this week. Um, so um, mm, and the protocol is really small because. We actually think all all we do in the network protocol is that we synchronize this entity component model. So, so the messages are basically um, create entity, remove entity, uh, like add component, remove component, and change attribute, and something else. It's a really small, small um, protocol. But uh, I can give a, the pointer to the um, to the protocol documentation after the talk, for example. Um, yeah, about the um, oh yeah, about and about the JavaScript that we use in the native uh, in the native client. One clar cl clarification that that doesn't have anything to do with the web. Um, let's see what what do I have as a next slide? Ah, oh, that is different. Um, did my extra slide come here? No, sorry, I have to go back. Mm. Yeah, I tried to add one slide, but I think I failed. So the JavaScript um, that we have in the native client um, is Qt script. So, so for example, for the UI, you have the Qt API, which I think is the same as the Linden view uses. I don't ah no, I don't think they use Qt for the um, for the um, for the witches, but they do use Qt something in in this client as well. But anyhow, that's so. So the native Tundra JavaScript is not um, a web browser JavaScript. It's just um, um, it's just a JavaScript API to the to the Tundra API where you can command the auger uh, renderer and the bullet physics and and um, and then Qt for for the UI stuff. Mm, yeah. Okay. So, um, some Mark Marcus's comment on the uh, 
this kind of leads me to the next next uh, slide where I put down some some ideas and uh, not necessarily good ones, but anyhow some ideas uh, about uh, how we could try try uh, doing um, something together again. So if if you find this uh, our our client interesting, um, it would be again possible to um, to use it to connect to OpenSIM. If you uh, if you uh, prefer to um, to continue using OpenSIM as the server, so there's basically two options. What we did originally in the Nali viewer, um, which was the name we used when it was a client only, and then when we all when we added the uh, the server component, we uh, sort of renamed it uh, Tundra. So so Nali had um, a module that implemented uh, LLUDP. So we could connect to um, even Second Life actually, and uh, and to um, unmodified OpenSIM servers. Um, so, but I think it might be more interesting to uh, to do the reverse this time to to actually implement a mod Tundra to um, to OpenSIM because it's a really simple protocol and and then it gives this extensibility and LLUDP protocol is a bit mad. It, there's a, a lot of messages and I think most of those have to do with uh, selling parcels and that sort of stuff. And and I think it's a nice idea to have this low-level, uh, simple uh, wire protocol um, which doesn't define the uh, the application level stuff. So... Um, Mm, so yeah, that's sort of to comment to Marcus about um, about this client, and um, and yeah, I think it is a possibility for for the OpenSIM community to to use this now mature code base to um, to innovate um, um, new platform features. Okay, I read more of the questions. Um, yeah, um, yeah, Justin makes a great point. Um, about Unity and, and OpenSIM and, and Real Extend, and, and it's true that it can be confusing. Uh, in a way, Tundra SDK is really similar to Unity. Um, um, we have the same entity component model, and and in the same way, we want to want it to be like a generic engine on which you can do anything. And um, but there's two differences. Um, one is that um, Tundra is open source, and the uh, and the other is that it's inherently inherently uh, networked. So it's similar to Open Simulator in that sense that it sort of works on the assumption that it's a virtual world that that uh, anything you have is something also that uh, that the others see, and you don't have to do anything ex extra uh, to have it. Um, a multi-user setup. So, um, but uh, of course, Unity has upsides as well. They have a great renderer and it runs fine on iOS and uh, Android and so forth. But but the uh, but the open source part and the uh, and the inherent inherently networked part are sort of um, um, the upsides of uh, of Tundra. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so idea three, that's something that I, I also think is sort of most interesting because the, um, the also the, um, the OpenSIM community would get really something um, sort of, yeah, perhaps really useful. And it's also something where, um, where we are going to work on anyway. We have now this quite substantial funding for uh, working on the web client. Um, I'll talk about that more in just a second. But um, but I'm going now back to Justin's comment about um, about this first point. Well, the one upside for Real Extend is that that I think it's no secret that that um, that we don't have a like much of a community. There's uh, 
we have a nice developers community, but there's no, there's nothing like the OpenSIM uh, users community. Um, we do survive because the companies um, uh, do business, but but we also I don't want to forget the sort of original dream of the uh, of the three D internet and uh, and the um, and this uh, and the and virtual worlds and and I, for example, wish that I would I could use these environments more for work for these kind of meetings and everything in the future and and um, and the hypercrit, for example, is really really exciting. So, uh, so one one motivation for us is, of course, that um, that if if, for example, some OpenSIM people would sometimes use uh, use the real extent client to for something. Um, uh, yeah, it would be just really really cool and interesting, and and I'm I'm also think that really beneficial that we would get more feedback from uh, from uh, enthusiastic virtual worlds people and. Uh, and um, and real extent would sort of serve its purpose that it would it would uh, allow people to um, to sort of do what they want with uh, with their worlds. Um, and we can return to that later. But but yeah, I can talk a little bit about that uh, EU project. Uh, it's quite new. Uh, uh, yeah, I think the final contracts are signed now. Uh, like last week or something like that. It's an ongoing, um, ongoing EU project that I didn't even know about earlier. You can see it in the uh, bottom left corner. There's this future internet PPP, and and this specific uh, project is uh, freeware, like FIware, and that's the future internet uh, software platform. So. Um, mm, so what's the deal here is that I didn't even know that this whole future internet thing existed earlier, but it's been going on for I don't know two years or something like that. And and uh, the background is that the European Commission um, and some big European IT companies sort of got together and and they saw that Europe is losing and lagging behind in in um, on the internet basically. And I think it's obviously true that. That uh, Facebook and Google and Amazon and Twitter and all those are from uh, from the states. So um, so the EU big folks wanted to have some initiative that that uh, would sort of um, yeah help European companies catch up and also make uh, innovative, nice. Uh, um, Internet services and so forth. Um, I have to say that I'm usually quite skeptical about this kind of like huge uh, top-down uh, development efforts. Like in the states, there was the internet two, but uh, I don't know how much came out of the internet two project. But I guess something did come out. But anyhow, there's this huge project. It's uh, 40 million dollars uh, or 40 million euros. Uh, the ongoing thing that started in uh, uh, a year or two ago and, and ends in next April, and uh, and it was really a, it was already an ongoing project, and they had this open call last fall where they were asking for somebody to implement um, a browser-based virtual worlds system, basically, and um, and it was easy sort of for us to uh, to respond to that call. Um, because we kind of had it already, uh, so they, in the end, then selected us to to do it, and um, yeah, now we are working on it. So yeah, so our part is this 2.7 million, which is like a huge <laughs> sum, but there's so many other things, this like augmented reality thing and, and display as service and, and the GIS and point of interest things and all the other stuff that we don't have that much for the, uh, for the actual um, uh, sort of the basic uh, 3D platform development, but we have some 300,000 or so anyways for the, for the sort of the bottom part, bottom part here. And um, 
so the plan in this project is to keep using um, the Tundra server and the entity component model. Um, yeah, and this is all open source. The whole uh, this whole effort is is targeted um, for open source development. And actually, we can use we will use some of this money to sort of open source uh, some things that are, are proprietary right now that have been developed in some some real extent projects. But yeah, this is open source. Um, so we are kind of happy that, that now that the big EU guys. Um, they like the entity component model. They they have adopted the, all, it already to to some of their own server codes, and so we will probably be keep using that protocol um, um, in the networking and and on the server. And and we are going to use probably web, web sockets. We've been also experimenting with uh, web RTC, which I think is interesting because it's UDP. And but then what happens on the on the client side? It's now sort of up for debate because uh, it's a requirement from this sort of from the customers' side that we we need to implement this uh, declar declar declarative uh, 3D stuff. Uh, if you happen to know about it, um, so uh, um, yeah, we'll see how how uh, exactly we will have the the scene in the in the client's memory but in any case the idea is to integrate to the DOM um, to the browser um, document object model uh, so for example when you log into a server uh, with the browser client um, you can use the browser debugger to see um, sort of the primitive data as I, I guess you would say and you can even then mod use the uh, for example the Chrome debugger to um, to modify something in the scene and and it reacts so so it's going to have this kind of a tight um, browser integra integration and and like a high level uh, declarative way to to define scenes so that's sort of the new new stuff um, yeah but Teravos's uh, comment that's um, that's an interesting point we're actually doing uh, performance uh, tests uh, right now and the uh, and sort of the other guys who are participating is are from the DFKI, and they have this library called XML3D.js. There, they already have this um, mm, this uh, declarative 3D stuff, and and um, and we actually now testing like which performs better. Um, Ah, so Robert knows XML 3D already. Yeah, so we're working together with those guys now. Oh, and I think they actually work with you at Intel too, because they were going to implement some distributed scene graph stuff to the server too. So yeah, that's sort of the big thing here now that we from this remote northern Finland, we are sort of now getting to the talk with the, these sort of big EU guys, and and um, and they liked uh, real extent enough. Um, so that it's sort of now being adopted in this uh, in this project. Um, there's about five minutes left or so, so uh, I'll just show some pretty pictures. And you can uh, ask more questions. There's some scenes that have been made. There's a there's a nice circus with uh, three mini games by Ludocraft, and um, and uh, and an airplane flying game and. And um, and this is a really nice church, the um, the one on the on the left from Haukipudas, a wooden church from the 1800s. Uh, no, seven, uh, yeah, 1800s. Uh, that's really nicely modeled, and all these are sort of available in the Meshmoon hosting system. So you can, if you install the client, you can visit this. And this is a the one with the old uh, fire truck is from from the Berlin um, uh, sort of fire museum, and that has been actually. What has been using the uh, what has been driving the the web uh, client development that um, it was the first scene that was made accessible with the web client and uh, and works well looks the same basically with the uh, with with three it's a small simple scene this is something where I made the particles so I like this this is connected to uh, to a real world um, private power plant which is used to um, to produce electricity and heat for the buildings 
for the well, this is actually Juha's house, the guy who started Relextend. Uh, has his own power plant as well, and he's using real extent to sort of monitor and control the uh, the energy flows in his home. And um, most use here in Oulu is, uh, and also elsewhere in Finland is actually in this sort of city planning, and, uh, and we are making a quite huge detailed c um, model from the city of Oulu. But but then then also um, this bottom left thing is. Um, from the Helsinki, um, the Aalto University, they are doing this sort of air aerial scanning based uh, model from whole Finland. So, so we are going to have some scalability issues. Um, and this shows something of, of the uh, of the customizability. So, for example, this application is for teaching how to operate this kind of agriculture device. I don't know what it is called in English, but you use it to collect the uh, harvest uh, wheat. So there's a little game where you have to learn how to maintain and the uh, the device. Um, so it's one example of a customer user interface. Um, yeah, some kind of harvester. This is a bit old um, from the School of the Future project where we also made it all sorts of uh, custom UIs and functionality that you could carry these objects around and you could easily just drag and drop images and so forth, all made with uh, scripting. The tools and um, and this is sort of and this is my last slide also sort of my favorite point point that for me the definition of virtual worlds is that that they can be anything then that that, uh, that yeah it's it, it's often useful to have avatars and and sometimes nice to have terrain and sometimes nice to have gravity but I really think that for me virtual world means really that that anything is possible so so I think it's nice to think of virtual worlds that that we can define how gravity works or whether there is gravity and and um, so this is one example of a different kind of world world where the whole world is just pong and so this is basically a, like a game um, and if I if I want to place make a place for pong it doesn't necessarily need need avatars for example and and um, but uh, but I would uh, regarding avatars as a last point I would also like to stress that. That the fact that we don't have anything about avatars in the, in the core doesn't mean that we wouldn't think that avatars are uh, important. I think it's quite the opposite. That when when the whole um, when the whole, for example, avatar system is a script, um, and and you are able to do any kind of features there without touching the wire protocol, I think that is really can be really powerful. That because anybody can then uh, enhance the avatar system and come up with new additions and new sort of innovate innovate with the concept of the avatar and so forth. So I think this is this is sort of the interesting interesting point about um, the extensibility and modularity. But, uh, but yeah, that was my talk and and um, and I think I used the time as well. I don't know where. What would be the best place to continue discussions? I think for for now we can talk here. Um, I'm fine also with using the the open simulator mailing lists, <laughs> for example, for discussions. If you don't consider that's off topic, you are also always welcome to the um, to post to the real extend um, mailing lists. We have these Google groups for users and developers. Yeah, mailing uh, at least the uh, real extent mailing lists uh, don't have much traffic, so uh, so at least there we there we can uh, talk. But but yeah, I'm fine with using the open sim lists as well. Yeah, and, and RSC, I'm on I'm on the uh, open sim dev, and we also have real extent dev. So, um, so yeah, and many of you are hanging out there still, uh, which is really nice. Uh, yeah. Thanks again for uh, for having me and 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 for the whole event it has been really really great. Thank you, Tony Alatalo, for a terrific presentation. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. In this room, the next session 
will be Open Simulator Configuration File World Tour with Justin Clark Casey. Thank you again to our speaker, and the audience will be back shortly with the next session. Thanks.